Right now on Morning News Now, path of destruction, tropical depression Claudette barreling across parts of the south, the tragic death toll left behind and where this powerful storm system is headed next. Back in action, New York City stepping up its reopening in an effort to return to normal. Over the weekend, the Foo Fighters performed at a packed Madison Square Garden while health experts issue a new dire warning. Why doctors say it's more important than ever to get vaccinated now. Tragic accident, a deadly car crash at a Pride event in Florida. What investigators are now saying about the accident and the dramatic new surveillance video showing exactly what went down. And ready, set, save. Rise and shine deal seekers, the Super Bowl of online shopping is upon us. The supply chain issues that could have your shopping cart running a little lighter than usual this year. But I'm ready for Prime Day. I keep both phones, <laughs> and we've got the apps open. So whatever happens, I'm ready to go. You can help me. <laughs> we'll take care of you. We'll take care of you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Aaron Gilchrist. And I'm Ellison Barber. Joe and Savannah are off. We begin this coronavirus pan- with the coronavirus pandemic and life looking a little more like pre-COVID times across the United States. Over this weekend, people across the country gathered for Juneteenth celebrations. Tourist attractions, including museums in D.C., reopened, and in New York City, Madison Square Garden held its first concert in more than a year. The Foo Fighters played to a packed crowd full of vaccinated fans. Right now, nearly 150 million Americans are fully vaccinated. That's a little more than 45 percent of the total U.S. population. But with the highly contagious Delta variant spreading, experts are warning that number is still too low. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar is standing by with answers to critical COVID questions. Let's begin, though, with NBC News correspondent Tracy Potts in Washington for us. Tracy, good morning. Uh, I know that experts right now are warning us about this Delta variant and and the possibility of a fall surge because of it. Uh, If not enough Americans get vaccinated, what might that look like? Well, it could look different in different places, Aaron, and and that's a key point uh, right now. In terms of not enough Americans, you just said we've got almost half fully vaccinated. They want to get to 75 percent, anything less than that. And experts are starting to get concerned about how this Delta variant may spread. Uh, Former FDA commissioner and we should note a board member of Pfizer, one of the vaccine makers, says that if more people don't get vaccinated, we could see this virus grow. One, uh, or this particular variant of it, one model shows 20% of the peak that we saw last winter. Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA uh, commissioner, says he's not sure if it'll be that high, but it could really depend on where you live. I think that's probably an aggressive estimate. I don't think it'll be quite that dire. But when you do look at those estimates, you see it varies widely between states. So Connecticut, for example, where I am, shows no upsurge of infection. But Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Missouri show very substantial upsurges of infection. It's based entirely on how much population-wide immunity you have based on vaccination. So bottom line, all those pictures that we saw over the weekend, lots of people out, lots of people ready to move forward with this. But we are not out of the woods yet. Tracy, let's talk internationally for a second. We know Europe is opening up to travelers this summer in a lot of places, but there's still going to be a while before Americans can travel to Canada and to Mexico. What do we know about that? Well, the government's now extended one more month the uh, land and, and ferry travel bans uh, between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. They've been doing this month by month since everything shut down in March of last year. Uh, interestingly, though, on the other side of our northern border, the Canadians and, and Prime Minister Trudeau's government getting some pressure to go ahead and open the border heading south, even though they have not hit uh, the 75% of people vaccinated that was supposed to be the trigger for that. So they're getting pressure uh, to come up with a plan within the next few weeks to let people come south while the federal government here is saying hold off for now. All right. Tracy Potts for us in Washington. It's been a while, Tracy. Good to see you. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar. Dr. Azar, I want to start with this Delta variant. We keep hearing more contagious, more severe if you are unvaccinated and contract this variant. What do we know, though, about how effective current vaccines are against the Delta variant? 
Well, good morning, Allison. Well, the good news is, is that for the mRNA vaccines, and uh, you're pretty well protected against the Delta variant. Now, this data is actually coming out of the UK, where they actually looked at how the Delta variant fared against the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, as well as the AstraZeneca vaccine. As you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine is not one that we have here in the US. And basically, after two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, your protection was at about 88%. So if we extrapolate to Moderna, um, which has the same, of course, technology with the mRNA, we can assume it's roughly the same. We don't, however, have that data uh, with the J&J &J vaccine. But remember, in all likelihood, with all vaccinations, you are protected from severe disease. But we do have that, at least that granular data, out of the UK right now, Allison. Hmm. Uh, and there's a new AP poll that's showing a majority of Americans are returning to life before COVID, if you will. But what should we be doing to continue protecting ourselves from COVID-19 as more people are interacting daily? Are there still concerns, particularly in the medical community, that it might be too soon to be opening back up? Well, yeah, I mean, I think you'll get a, a, a variety of opinions on that. You know, I think it is certainly safe to say that if you are fully vaccinated, um, you know, you can essentially go about life as you would have pre-pandemic. And remember, this also has to do with your own uh, what we call risk tolerance. That means what are you willing to potentially risk based on your, uh, you know, underlying medical problems, your household risks, that that kind of thing. You know, we, we should spend some time talking about the fact that certain individuals who are immunocompromised may have not mounted um, as robust an immune response to vaccination. So in spite of the fact that they are fully vaccinated, they may not actually be as protected. If you're unvaccinated, this is a particularly perilous time, given the, uh, the, the, the surgence, I should say, of the Delta variant. It's really increasing here in the U.S. at a clip, Allison. And as you mentioned, it is likely more virulent uh, and, as we know, much more contagious. And Dr. Azer, you touched on the United Kingdom and studies there. There is a new U.K. study that deals specifically with the long-term effects that COVID-19 is having on patients. Take a listen to what former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb had to say, and then I'll ask you a question on the back end. About 300 people, a little over 300 people developed COVID. And when it compared those individuals who developed COVID against matched controls, people who were similar, who didn't develop COVID, they saw a pretty persistent um, decline in certain brain tissue matter. Certain areas of their brain showed a decline in actual tissue, a shrinkage of parts of their brain. So what does this tell us, Dr. Azar, about how COVID impacts the body? Have we sort of reached a point where long haul COVID can be looked at a little more closely than before? Well, absolutely. And, you know, if you just look at the sheer numbers of people who've been infected with COVID-19 and the estimates of individuals who will have lingering symptoms after their initial infection, which, by the way, doesn't need to be severe. It could even be mild or asymptomatic infection. And, and you know, patients months, months later still having significant headaches and brain fog and exhaustion and fatigue. Um, you know, it's incredibly important, not only the fact that many public health experts say that this will be the next public health emergency emergency for the U.S. just in terms of dollars. Um, but it's important not only to get insight into what's happening with COVID-19 and this post-viral syndrome, but all post-viral and post-infectious syndromes that have come before it, and specifically chronic fatigue syndrome, that community is certainly hoping that some scientific insight and potentially therapeutics will come out of this devastation. Allison. All right. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you so much. We're learning new details about a pride celebration that turned tragic in Florida over the weekend. One person was killed, another injured after a truck in the Stonewall Pride Parade in Wilton Manors plowed into the crowd on Saturday. Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz was in a car just inches away when it happened. I don't know if I can get across how devastating it is to watch someone run down and, and lose their life. In front, of, in front of so many people who were there to celebrate. Hmm. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us now with more on this. Priscilla, uh, what are police saying about exactly what happened there in Florida? Yeah. Well, Aaron, the white pickup truck at the center of this uh, was the lead car in the parade. And now police are calling this a, quote, tragic accident, writing in a statement 
yesterday that today we know yesterday's incident was a tragic accident and not a criminal act directed at any one or any group of individuals. Now, we know that this car cut across all lanes of traffic and ultimately uh, ran into the fence of a business. The driver on the scene was cooperative and the police did conduct a DUI test and did not find that he was uh, intoxicated and no arrests have been made in this incident. Aaron. Priscilla, NBC News has also obtained new video, surveillance video that shows the truck. Uh, it crashed into a garden center after it hit all those people in the crowd there on Saturday. What more do we know about the driver in this case and, and anything uh, about the victims, too? Uh, yeah, Aaron, we know that the driver was a 77-year-old man. Uh, he was driving in the parade because he had an ailment that uh, he was unable to walk, and so that's why he was behind the wheel of that vehicle. Now, as for uh, the driver and the victims, we know that they were all members of the gay men's uh, chorus, but the names of those victims have not yet been released. Again, one dead and one who is currently recovering in the hospital. Aaron. Just an awful tragedy in the middle of a celebration there in Florida. Uh, Priscilla Thompson for us today. Priscilla, thank you. Now to that devastating weather system that's making its way across the south. Tropical storm Claudette has been downgraded to a depression, but after it left a path of destruction in Alabama. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins us now from East Bruton, Alabama. Kathy. Overnight, a likely tornado ripping through the Chicago suburbs with reports of power outages, downed trees and extensive damage, including flooding at O'Hare Airport. The severe storm system also hitting Indiana. And down south, another path of destruction left behind by tropical depression Claudette. At least 12 people, including 10 children, killed. The storm triggering treacherous conditions in southern Alabama, where authorities say a hydroplaning car likely set off a chain reaction on the interstate. Eight children ages 4 to 17 were traveling in a small bus operated by the Alabama Sheriff's Youth Ranch when it got caught in the pileup. Only the ranch director who was driving survived. Survived. She lost two of her own children in the crash. The multi-car crash also killing Cody Fox and his nine-month-old daughter Ariana, who were in a separate vehicle. I've never seen anything like it. It was horrific. The storm spurred tornadoes too. One touching down in Bruton, Alabama, flattening homes, ripping roofs, and tossing debris for miles. All of a sudden, the trees over this way, behind the houses over there, they just kind of just, it was just like they imploded. High winds and life-threatening flooding also leading to rescues. Dauphin Island's mayor saying they're still feeling the effects from past storms. We're at a situation that the shoreline is just so decimated at this point that it just takes very little, again, high tides wave action to push water into the interior of the island. The lashing in Louisiana, washing out streets and pushing water into homes. We had about four inches throughout our entire house and that happened within about an hour. Along the Florida Panhandle, strong winds and flash floods bring rough seas and high surf, while fire crews in Georgia rescued a woman trapped inside her car, freeing her from a fallen tree and power lines. Kathy, tell us more about this likely tornado in Naperville, Illinois, and, and the damage that is being reported so far. Yeah, the, the information is still coming in. And, and like you said, this is a reported tornado. So we should know perhaps in the next several hours once folks are on the ground and surveying the damage. But right now we are told that uh, there are several minor injuries as well as uh, some damage to homes in that area as well. Kathy Parks in Alabama for us. Thank you so much. Still ahead, a rare bit of good news surrounding Tokyo's embattled Olympic Games. Coming up, what we're now learning about fans that will be attending the big event. 
Overnight, there has been an update on whether fans will be allowed into venues at the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo. Organizers have confirmed Japanese spectators will be allowed, setting the limit at 50 percent of the venue's capacity, up to 10,000 people. The Games kick off in just over a month in the capital city, where the Japanese government recently lifted the state of emergency. But Tokyo remains under heavy restrictions ahead of the Olympics, as officials warn of a potential coronavirus surge. NBC News correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer joins us now with the latest from Beijing. Janice, big news this morning. What went into this decision and how are athletes as well as fans reacting to it? Well, months of speculation went into this decision, Ellison. Uh, there had been a lot of anticipation because this was seen as a final hurdle uh, for officials. And so with this decision, it looks like there's a boost in certainty that the games will still go ahead despite these lingering concerns. Now, this doesn't affect any foreign visitors. That was determined months ago that there would be no foreign fans allowed into Olympic venues. But it is good news for domestic fans. Uh, officials saying that they will have 50 percent capacity at each venue to a maximum of 10,000 people. The challenge that they have now, though, is that they pre-sold about four million tickets. So it looks like they're going to be putting it all into a lottery system to determine who gets to go to which events. The competition schedule remains unchanged. And Tokyo, I understand, still has a lot of COVID-19 restrictions in place. What would happen if cases do start to rise? before the games begin. Well, officials were very clear in making this determination today that if another state of emergency was required in, over, in order to get COVID infections under control or if there was uh, other needs beyond their control, that they would uh, look at reevaluating these plans for domestic fans or scrapping them altogether. We have to remember that the top advisor, the top medical advisor in Tokyo just last week cautioned against having any fans. He said that the safest way to pull off the games would be to have nobody there. And the majority of Japanese are opposed to having the games at all. Polls have been showing uh, roughly 80 percent of people uh, not wanting the games to happen. Thousands of volunteers have quit. The concern, of course, is that this is going to be a massive super spreader event with thousands of athletes and officials pouring into Tokyo from around the world. And I mean, you, you look at Uganda's Olympic team, they just had a member of that team test positive for COVID-19 and they were not allowed into Japan. Is that something that's raising any additional concerns since athletes do not have to be vaccinated? Well, it's, it's raising concerns because the, the athlete who tested positive um, uh, on arrival appears to have been turned back, but uh, teammates who could be considered close contacts were apparently allowed to carry on. Uh, so there will be some scrutiny um, of exactly how officials are going to carry out this screening process. They say that athletes are going to be tested regularly. They have other restrictions in place, like a no socializing policy at the athlete's village. They have a ban on shouting and uh, also rules on wearing masks uh, when traveling between venues. The the IOC president at the news conference today said that they are confident in the fact that 80 percent of athletes and officials who will be staying at the athletes village will be vaccinated. And they stressed the importance of having spectators watching live for the athletes self-esteem. Here's more of what he had to say. So uh, for the residents of the Olympic villages, it will be well above 80 percent. So it looks like these games will go ahead again. They'll reevaluate things after July 12th, depending on the situation with the spread of COVID-19. But that means that the opening ceremony, Ellison, is just a little over one month away. Hard to believe. Well, Janice, thank you so much for that report. We appreciate it. Let's get a look at what else is making news around the world this morning. NBC News correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us this morning. Good morning, Raf. 
Aaron Ellison, good morning. Iran has elected hardline cleric Ibrahim Raisi as its next president. Raisi already under U.S. sanctions for human rights abuses, and he was elected on a low turnout Friday after his more moderate rivals were barred from running in the election. He'll be a key player as President Biden tries to revive the Iran nuclear deal. Now talk about a trial by fire, the U.S. Navy launching live explosives at one of its own aircraft carriers to test how it would fare in an actual battle. They did it by detonating nearly 20 tons of explosives near the USS Gerald R. Ford. The blast so big it registered as a 3.9 magnitude earthquake. And finally, Usain Bolt, the world's fastest man, is the father of twins. The sprinter announcing on Father's Day his partner had given birth to boys Saint and Thunder. Thunder Bolt, get it? The family are doing well. And guys, you have to assume those are going to be some pretty quick kids when they grow up. <laughs> With a name like Thunderbolt, you have to. No pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> Raph Sanchez for us today. Raph, thank you. And coming up, the Biden administration's agenda once again being put to the test this week on Capitol Hill. We'll bring you the latest from inside the Beltway next. In Chicago, a spike in violent crime is being met with a different kind of policing. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster shows us how the city's top cop is going all in on efforts to engage the community. This is what it looks like. Yeah, this is literally, you're just walking out in the street and you're talking to folks. It's community policing and Deputy Chief Angel Navales is charged with refreshing the decades old concept. The program and its leader getting a major endorsement from Chicago's top cop. This is a transformative moment for CPD. A moment that can't come soon enough for a city that's seen shootings spike 43 percent and murders rise 33 percent just this year. For Navalis, the solution is in the community. Once you establish a relationship with folks, people are, and they trust you, people are more apt to speak to you, to exchange information with you tell you about problems that sometimes we don't think are police problems, but may lead to police problems. Chicago's reimagined neighborhood policing initiative pushes officers to break from traditional policing and engage the public, passing out food, coaching sports, and hosting events. It commits two officers, or DCOs, to every South and West Side district. Their job was to proactively, in the field, engage members of the community. And those two officers, that is their only job? That is their only job, so they're not responsible for radio calls. And researchers say in its first year, it seemed to be working. Trust in police in the pilot district was on the rise. The aim is to have the police be responsive to communities. We need the community to say what it wants and to expect that that's what policing is going to look like. While the pandemic and protests rolled back initial progress, community leaders assisting the program say they've seen change. What did it look like before you had DCOs here who you were able to reach out to? It was just um, calling and it was just going into a dead zone. Fast forward at the pandemic, we're walking with some of the DCOs and four, five, six people coming up to them, knowing them by name. And you know, that's what we want. But advocacy director Nicole McBride says she's concerned the program could be expanding too quickly, emphasizing the need for change to last. Oftentimes what happens, especially in major cities, is that program after program is introduced, then it's defunded or it's forgotten about or something else becomes the new highlight reel. And so I think that there's skepticism sometimes from community members that their voices actually will be heard this time. It has been almost 100 days since the shooting spree that left eight people dead in Atlanta. The attacks drew attention to a rise in anti-Asian violence in the United States. MSNBC anchor Richard Louis went to Georgia to speak with families who were still searching for answers and justice. The Atlanta shootings, as Reverend Al Sharpton puts it, had the impact of Bloody Sunday on the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And for Asian Americans, the 100-day mark this week is like a first anniversary. We spoke exclusively with five of the eight victims' families. In the case of Bobby Peterson, he drove for hours looking for his mother after he heard her work was attacked. After her death, he moved into his mother's home and invited us in to visit with him. My mother's name is Young A.U. And 
she was 63. My mother's been in the United States since 1982, where she met my father in Korea. They're married. And then, like I said, they moved to Fort Benning, Georgia. My friends very much knew that I was black and Korean. And so they knew that it was different, like taking off the shoes in the house and, and again, eating on the floor, eating with chopsticks. I recently moved into my mother's house. She spoke Korean in the house to her friends, but my brother and I didn't pick up on it. Yeah. <laughs> we spoke enough to say hello and bye. So my mother uh, was not a patient woman. So when she said, hey, Bobby, are you gonna be here at 10 o'clock? At nine o'clock, she was probably already at the door waiting for me, right? Her and her dog were uh, waiting for me. And so when she saw my car um, pull up, yeah. they both would be sitting there smiling, waving. Or she would look at me first and she would say, Bobby, you have lost weight. Huh. Um, so I was like, Mom, what about, you know, a hug? Or, hey, how you doing? It's hard every time I pull into the complex because the day that my mother was killed, I had to look for her. And that's, uh, I had to find out whether it was her or not. And during that day, we were looking for her car. And right, and I drove through the complex. Through this complex? Correct. I remember pulling in and anticipating her car being here. Hoping. Hoping that she was asleep. Hoping that she was here. And so every time I pull in, I remember her car wasn't there. And so I'm reminded of that every single time I pull in, that that's when I knew that she wasn't coming back. Bobby, drawing on his mixed-race background, now says his unique voice can and must do something to bring different communities together, and that the country should not forget this, because he will not, as he grapples with questions about the death penalty, hate crimes, and what this all means for the country. And you can tune in to watch Remember the Flowers, Atlanta shootings 100 days later, and see Richard's interviews with the four other families on NBCNews.com forward slash Asian dash America. In Washington this morning, new developments in the ongoing battle over infrastructure. President Biden has made it one of his top priorities. And as early as today, he'll be reviewing a potential compromise bill from a bipartisan group of senators. But the support of progressives is not assured. NBC News White House correspondent Jeff Bennett joins us now. Good morning, Jeff. Hey, Allison. Good morning. You're right. This week is a pivotal week in terms of President Biden. Biden working with congressional Democrats and Republicans, for that matter, to secure agreements on a range of key policy issues, including voting rights reform and infrastructure. But right now, there is no clear path forward for either of these issues. This week, President Biden's agenda being put to the test, first on infrastructure. As early as today, a group of centrist senators are set to unveil their bipartisan infrastructure deal. This helps President Biden keep that pledge of having an infrastructure package, but also to keep his pledge of doing things across the aisle and getting something done. At least 21 Democratic and Republican senators say they support the roughly $1 trillion proposal, which would not raise taxes on corporations or wealthy Americans. The plan would revitalize roads, bridges and broadband, but would not meet many Democrats' demands for investments in clean energy and social programs. Several progressive senators say the deal doesn't go far enough and disagree over how to pay for it. On Tuesday, the Senate is set for a key vote on a sweeping rewrite of voting and election law. Democrats are coalescing around a compromise offered up by West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. His plan would make Election Day a federal holiday, ban partisan gerrymandering, and require voter ID at the polls. Democrats argue access to voting should be expanded. Around the country, Republican state legislators in over a dozen states have enacted laws this year to restrict access to the polls. And Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell says federal voting rights legislation is a no-go. Totally inappropriate. All Republicans, I think, will oppose that as well. The president facing pressure both political and personal, with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops voting to move forward with drafting a formal statement on the meaning of communion, 
which will include whether Mr. Biden and other politicians should be denied the right based on their stance on abortion. President Biden, a devout Catholic who routinely attends mass, downplayed the issue. That's a private matter, and I don't think that's going to happen. Now, President Biden says he personally opposes abortion, but that's not a view he's going to impose on Americans who feel otherwise. Now, as for policy, I have Republican Senator Lindsey Graham uh, telling the president that if he's looking for a bipartisan bill, there's a bipartisan bill available for the taking. But just earlier today, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the White House still needs more details on what's in this bipartisan agreement and more to the point how to pay for it. Aaron Ellison. All right, Jeff Bennett for us at the White House this morning. Jeff, thank you. Let's go to the Hill now. We're joined by Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell to talk a little bit more about some of the developments happening there. Leanne, I want to start with infrastructure. Uh, We just heard in Jeff's piece a little bit about this compromise bill that could be unveiled today. But we also have Senate Democrats who are considering passing a second uh, a second package using budget reconciliation. Lots of balls in the air right now. What are the, some of the priorities around that effort and how likely are progressives to, to push that through? That's a great way to put it, Aaron. Lots of balls in the air. And we're wait, wait, waiting to see which one is able to be caught. Mm. So first, there's this bipartisan $1 trillion infrastructure bill that we're still waiting. We've been waiting for a couple of weeks on the details, and that's because they are still trying to work them out, including how to pay for it. And the question for that is, are they going to gain the support of 60 senators in order to pass it? They say they have the support of 11 Republicans, which is good. Uh, But where do the progressives stand? Let's listen to what Senator Bernie Sanders said on Meet the Press yesterday about this bipartisan package. And we'll talk on the other side. As I understand that the so-called bipartisan plan really only provides about 25 percent of the money that the president asked for, about $580 billion. Nobody really knows what is going to be in this bipartisan agreement uh, and how it is going to be paid for. So if it is roads and bridges, yeah, of course we need to do that, and I support that. If it is regressive taxation, you know, raising the gas tax or a fee on electric vehicles or the privatization of infrastructure, no, I wouldn't support it. So Democrats led by Senator Bernie Sanders are working on this reconciliation package that you mentioned that could be upward of six trillion dollars, including traditional infrastructure, elder care, child care and a whole host of Democratic priorities, Aaron. At the same time, uh, Leanne, voting is also on the agenda this week with Senator Joe Manchin's bill facing a procedural vote on Tuesday. We know this is a, a more limited bill than what Democrats were proposing. What's the latest there? It, that's right. It is more limited. It is uh, an idea by Senator Joe Manchin and his quest to get bipartisan support for voting rights. He is working Republicans extremely hard. I have witnessed this in the halls of the Capitol where he's huddling with Republicans about this legislation. But it is a very, very heavy lift to get Republicans to support this bill or any bill regarding voting rights, as Republicans mostly say that the federal government should not be involved in that. It should be left up to the state. Still, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has promised a vote on this legislation this week, and it's going to be much better for Democrats if they can get Joe Manchin to sign on and there would be bipart- or, uh, uh, there'd be um, all Democratic support for this bill would be much better than bipartisan opposition against it, Aaron. Leah, I I want to ask you while I have you, uh, I know President Biden is going to meet with regulators today to get an update on the the country's financial picture. What do you know about that meeting? Well, it is a regular meeting, but there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy and people are trying to figure out what everything means, especially as Republicans are invoking fears of inflation. There's been a little bit of swing in the stock market trying to get a sense of what's happening in the unemployment uh, realm. So this is a regular meeting, but it'll be interesting to see what the president says coming out of this meeting and if anything is going to change as far as uh, economic regulatory policy, Aaron. All right, Leanne Caldwell for us this morning. Leanne, thank you. Well, from infrastructure negotiations to the future of U.S.-Russia relations, Meet the Press prepped us for the week ahead. Moderator Chuck Todd has a look at some of the highlights. On this week's Meet the Press, we focused on President Biden's first overseas trip, including the summit meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. 
and his domestic diplomacy that he needs to uh, deal with in Washington as the infrastructure negotiations enter that make or break phase. Here are some of the most important answers we got from Meet the Press Compressed. What is in the bipartisan bill in terms of spending is from what I can see mostly good. It is roads and bridges, and we need to do that. That is what we are proposing in our legislation, but in much greater numbers. Uh, one of the concerns that I do have about the bipartisan bill is how they are going to pay uh, for their proposals. And, and they're not clear yet. I don't know that they even know yet, but some of the speculation is raising a gas tax, which I don't support, a fee on electric vehicles, privatization of infrastructure. Those are proposals that I would not support. How committed is this group of 11 Republicans to stick and buy this deal, even if Mitch McConnell says he can't vote for it? I think we're absolutely committed to it. And I think there's a number of others as well on both sides of the aisle. Uh, last week, I heard from a lot of my colleagues saying, I just need to look at one other issue. You know, can you do this? Can you do that? But uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in having a bipartisan proposal. What should we watch for to find out whether this summit was a good idea or not? I think what we'll have to see is whether there are additional meetings at high level. You know, we've heard as we've come out of the summit that there have been some plans for having strategic stability talks. Those are the talks about how we're going to manage our respective nuclear arsenals. But the main problem is really in cyber, which I think you were alluding to in the run up uh, to this discussion. And that's where we're going to have to see whether we're able to actually sit down and have some serious cyber talks, not just at the working level, but something that takes it up to try to reach some kind of agreement. There's some concern that we may have given Putin a new status quo. Did Putin get more out of this than we realized? The symbolism of having a sit down with the American president. Absolutely. That is a very important win for Putin. But it's not a win if nothing happens out of it. That is just an episodic event. And, you know, he can't take that to the bank for a long time and cash it in. He's got to basically present himself at home as the great statesman because he himself has to subject uh, his presidency to a, a re-election. A judge has blocked the CDC from enforcing coronavirus restriction rules for cruise ships in Florida. It is a big win for the cruise industry, and it comes as Royal Caribbean launched its first trial cruise from Miami to the Bahamas. NBC News reporter Gary Grumbach has more. For the first time in 15 months, freedom of the seas behind me is hitting the seas. And that's great news for Royal Caribbean and for cruising fans all over the country. But it doesn't come without some controversy. Just this weekend, a federal judge here in Florida decided that the mandates the CDC puts on cruise lines aren't allowed to be put on cruise lines. And that includes what's happening here, which is a CDC mandated simulation voyage of the freedom of the seas. What this is going to look like is 600 Royal Caribbean volunteer employees and their guests going on this cruise, it's a three-day cruise to the Bahamas and to Coco Cay, and they're going to be doing everything a cruise does. They're going to be enjoying the pools, enjoying the arcade, enjoying everything that is on a cruise, but it's going to be looking a little bit different. Just like things are these days, everything happens with a tap of an iPhone app. Instead of the going to a place to learn the safety drill, you're going to be doing it on your iPhone. You'll learn what a horn sounds like on your iPhone. You're also able to make restaurant reservations on your iPhone. We talked to a number of the employees. Here's what they had to say. I'm super excited to be back on board and to be the first cruise out of Miami to be on the simulation cruise and to say that I was here means a lot to me because that particular ship, I brought her over from Europe on her transatlantic cruise when she was brand new back in 2006. As an industry, it's important. I mean, we, we see other industries, other industries in the travel sector like airlines, buses, everything, and, and we really want to just be the same and be in business. Now, this is an opportunity for the CDC and for Royal Caribbean to see what works, see what doesn't work, and to fix anything that needs to be changed ahead of the busy summer and fall sold out months for the cruise line. Now, the general consensus among the medical community is that if you're fully vaccinated, go for it. Go on the cruise. Enjoy yourself. But if you're not fully vaccinated, it's especially dangerous to be able to go on the cruise these days, especially considering some of the variants of coronavirus that are out there. Gary Grumbach reporting there. After a year of virtual learning, a lot of kids and parents are eager to get back to the time-honored tradition of summer sleepaway camp. At the same time, hundreds of camps across the U.S. are struggling to find enough workers. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns went to a camp in rural Pennsylvania for a closer look. 
Last summer, 84% of overnight camps in the U.S. weren't able to operate because of COVID-19. The good news is this summer, many of those camps are able to welcome back campers as COVID rates have dropped. But the bad news is a lot of camps are struggling to find enough employees to operate these summer camps. Part of the problem has to do with visas for camp counselors from overseas. For camp director Lauren Rutkowski, preparing to open her sleepaway camp in rural Pennsylvania is always a challenge. But this year, it's been exceptionally difficult. All over our industry, people are struggling for staff. Camps across the country rely on international staffers who come on J-1 visas. Camp IHC typically employs nearly 200 counselors from overseas. But this year, the COVID travel ban forced a number of consulates and embassies to stop granting visas, leaving camps like Lawrence struggling to fill vital positions. How big a portion of your counselors are from overseas? So typically anywhere from 30 to 40 percent will be international. How does that compare to what you have this year? So we've probably cut it in half. According to Scott Brody, national board chair of the American Camp Association, the visa issue has contributed to a national camp crisis. It's caused some camps to close completely. Other camps are cutting sessions, cutting numbers. Especially in demand, camp lifeguards and boating and climbing instructors. And the number of college students applying for camp positions is way down, too. After a year of, uh, of confinement, they want to spread their wings and, uh, you know, coming to camp uh, and giving up some of that uh, really wasn't that attractive for some. Some international camp workers are finding their way into the U.S. by way of Mexico. That's where Irish native and head camp counselor Sean Yelverton got his visa. We're talking total probably 15, 16 days. But others, like Roxy Bradley, weren't so lucky. The U.K. native was a Camp IHC counselor before the pandemic, but this summer she was unable to get a visa to return. I'm upset. I'm frustrated. Like, I wish I could be there. Lauren said to reopen this summer, she launched a website and social media campaign aimed at recruiting American college students to fill positions. It worked. She's found enough workers for now. That the kids are going to come here and they are going to feel that everything is normal. But it was an absolute beast of a job getting to that point. The camp directors and experts we spoke with say they're hopeful that these visa issues will be rectified by next summer. But in the meantime, they say the timing for this couldn't be worse. Camp directors are saying their phones are ringing off the hook as more families than ever are looking to send their kids back to the outdoors to have connections again with other campers. At the same time, this is also a summer when there just aren't enough camp workers to go around. Coming up, it is open season on Amazon for all those highly anticipated Prime Day deals. But you might run into a snag or two when filling up that shopping cart. We'll explain next. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Dominique Chu joins us now this morning. Hi, Dominique. Hey, good morning, Ellison. Good morning, Aaron. Well, today is a huge day for Amazon. Its annual two-day Prime event is underway already. It's the first time that the sale takes place in the month of June. Now, last year, you may recall that Prime Day was moved to mid-October during the virus pandemic. Amazon says this year's event will feature 2 million deals for shoppers in 20 countries. Now, Prime Day may be a big thing for bargain hunters, but it's generally a non-event for many investors. Amazon typically puts out a press release with some notable sales milestones, but doesn't really offer any actual financial details around how much they sell or how many profits they've made. So that leaves investors to try to parse through the language for any clues. Last year, the stock actually fell after Prime Day as Amazon really didn't claim that it was the largest shopping event in the company's history. And supply chain issues are going to play a part in this story. It could have an effect on what you might actually be able to buy during Prime Day. The retail industry is grappling with widespread supply chain issues, making it challenging to stock stores and distribution centers and keep up with consumer demand. Now, a COVID outbreak in southern China has also 
crippled things. It's home to one of the busiest ports in the world. That's really compounding the problem. Amazon sellers who import their products from China have tried to stock up ahead of Prime Day for inventory reasons and whatnot. Now, guys, Ellison, Aaron, I don't know about you. I've already kind of taken a peek at what's going on here, but it's the competitive landscape because Target, Walmart, Best Buy and others are all running competing sales at the same time. So it might be a good thing if you can find a deal on some of those consumer electronics. Yeah, that's how we win. When everybody else wants to get in on on the on the uh, potential buyers, it's it's good for us. I've got all the apps ready to go today. The the big important (laughs) question. Anybody have a good top of the to buy list that we should add to ours? No, I don't know. You know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for one of those backups for photos on my iPhone so I don't have to keep on and lose things. So I'm, I'm in the market for that right now. Smart move. Good luck with that, Dom. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Appreciate guys. you. Thanks. You got it. Well, some heartbreaking news out of the White House this morning. Coming up, the first family remembering their longtime family pet. Stay with us. The first family is saying goodbye to their beloved pet. The president and first lady announcing the family dog Champ died on Saturday. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has more on how the 13-year-old German Shepherd impacted the Bidens. Our hearts are heavy. A tribute from the president and first lady honoring their cherished companion, 13-year-old German Shepherd Champ, who passed peacefully at home. Wherever we were, he wanted to be. And being next to his people meant sharing the spotlight as a first dog. I'm Jill Biden here at the White House with our two dogs, Champ and Major. A good boy in the Oval Office and on the South Lawn. Introduced when Kelly Clarkson brought her TV show to the White House. They run all over, which is so nice. That It's a beautiful lawn. While the younger lad, three-year-old Major, made headlines earlier this year for nipping staff, Champ was the calm presence. He thinks he's mm-hmm. Secret Service. Champ's skills included something that runs in the family, right. as 60 Minutes found out in 2015. He's a talker. Watch this. Hey, Champ, you want to play golf? <laughs> Well, where's the golf club? He joined the family shortly after Mr. Biden was elected vice president in 2008. I've had German shepherds my uh, from the time I was a kid. The Biden's Christmas video put a soundtrack to Champ and Major's differing speeds. When the First Lady decorated the White House North Lawn for Valentine's Day, Champ, the elder statesman, came along. The Bidens wrote of Champ, In our most joyful moments and in our most grief-stricken days, he was there with us. The president, who has known every shade of grief in his life, now mourns the passing of a faithful friend of 13 years. See you, Champ. Kelly O'Donnell, NBC News, The White House. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.